I'm not what you would call a contemporary traditional Republican. My major political mentor being Ron Paul. This put me at an interesting crossroad with our party, and I was certainly disillusioned with it after 2012. However, being a political science major and always thinking of ways to win, it's something I believe in, I was still loyal to the party. The nice thing about social media is it allowed me to still track Republican groups and occasionally give my point of view on issues that I care about. It was one of these comments on the Oregon College Republican page about the Iraq War that initiated my introduction to Caleb Hugel, the Federation Chair. From there, he lended his aid with, from the Federation side for Jordan and I to start this chapter here at SOU. By being flexible and allowing other types of Republicans into these organizations, we are expanding our voter base. This is a key step to victory for the Republican Party. We must reach out to other communities, we must register young voters, and that means students as well. This is how we are going to win. This is how Reagan did it, this is how the Democrats do it, and this is what we need to do if we want to win in November and 2016. Always keep in mind, though, with this last bit, that just always, that remember that our values inform our politics, that our politics don't serve our values. So keep that in mind. Thank you. Thanks for having us here tonight. First of all, I'd like to say that I went to school here when it was SOC, and I didn't know we had this many conservatives in the whole school. I thought it was me and one other guy. But anyway, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight about party unity. We're going through a primary process here that you're seeing. You're going to have different people saying different things, but yet it's the same party. And I, I remember one time I was speaking in front of a, a group of people, and a lady in the back, this was when Alan Alley was running for governor, and a lady in the back said, I can't support Alan Allen. Well, why? Well, because of his position on cap and trade. Is that the only reason? Yes. But I can't vote for him because of that. So that immediately, I immediately said, you know, when it comes to a primary, you can have your dotting book. You can have your choices. You can have your differences. But when that is final, whoever comes out of there the party has to unite behind, because I'll tell you why. How many of you have, are married, and how many of you have girlfriends, and how many of you have always agreed with them? Yeah, I didn't think so. That's the way it is in politics as well. You may have someone that you agree 90%, 95% of the time. I'll tell you what, that's much better than having a, a, an individual that you agree with 5 or 10% of the time. That's a fact. So that's what we must strive for. That's what we must do. We must unite behind and march behind anyone that comes out of these primaries as our warrior, because we have to send them off. We have a great chance, I think, for one, we're going to have a different governor, I believe. Dennis Richardson is going to be your next governor. Speaking only of the state situation here, because that's the one that I understand a little bit better than most. I think we have a great chance of either breaking even in the Senate, a 15-15 tie, or not losing any ground, and we may even gain one. So that'll be up to whatever happens in the Albany Benton, Lynn, Lynn Benton race itself. As for the House race themselves, I think that we have an opportunity to get maybe to 29 to 31, our favor. It's going to depend upon what Dennis does. It's going to depend upon how this thing unravels with Cover Oregon. It's going to depend upon whether it's brought up that our governor has squandered $176 million away on the bridge that we've never stuck a, a shovel in the ground. It's going to, a, lot, a lot going to depend upon this race. But I think the mood of the country and the mood of the people of the state of Oregon is that it's time for a change. We haven't had a Republican governor in 30 years or so. Last one was Victor Tia, and I think it's time that we have Dennis Richardson as our next one. I want to emphasize one thing. If you prostitute your principles, you lose the very essence of your soul. Never prostitute your principles. 
Now, from here on, I don't know who's next, but I'll tell you what, you have some great candidates, you have some great choices, but more importantly, after this, after this primary's over, we need to unite behind whoever comes out of these primaries and get behind them. Thank you. The one thing I want to emphasize and wanted to talk about very, very briefly this evening was the fact that what this campaign is really going to be about in the end is about leadership. What this, what this is going to be, what my campaign is going to be running on, and it's what we ought to be thinking about as Republicans. Because one of the things that Republicans really need to step forward and do and show is that Republicans know how to lead and they know how to govern. If you look around and you see what people sometimes talk about the Republican Party, they say, well, so what are you going to do? So what are you, you're, you seem to be against some things. But what, what we really need to do is be, be putting forward some good, positive ideas that we have. And we have lots of them. Now, we can all step back and say, we can show how the other party or other folks within the, uh, within the, the political establishment, particularly in the state of Oregon, have not done a good job of leading. You can point to Obamacare. You can point to, you can point to uh, Cover Oregon. But the question is, for, for a candidate and for, uh, for this party is, so what would you have done differently? And I'm spending a lot of time looking at that and, 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 and thinking about when I, when I confront <coughs> my opponent, what am I going to talk about? And I think you as Republicans need to be prepared to do the same thing. For example, there are some great ideas that have been put forward, again, uh, uh, as a replacement for uh, Obamacare by Senator Coburn. He's one of the doctors in the, in the U.S. Senate. There's some great ideas you can get behind. Spend a little bit of time looking at that. I'm spending a bunch of time right now looking into, because I know that my opponent was one of the principal architects of Cover Oregon. So the question is, well, it does you a lot of good to talk about that, but what, do you, what would you do differently? And I'm spending a lot of time doing that, because there really are some really good ideas, and there were some good strategic alternatives that we could have, that we could have put forward. So I, 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 I want to I wanna emphasize that to everybody here, that we really need to be thinking about that. One of the other things, then, that, that uh, I've, I've noticed while I've been working up there at, at the, uh, the pleasure of working with Sal and Dennis up there, it's been really great. I've had a chance to work with the, with the Senate Republicans, and I can tell you, based on what I, what I saw with the Senate Republicans in that caucus, um, I'm excited to get back into that. You know, sometimes you go up there and you watch what's going to happen and you think, well, maybe I don't really want to, don't want to run again. But as you all are well aware, I came very, very close last time. Now, maybe some of the students don't know this. How many of you, how many of you know that I did run uh, a few, uh, four years ago? Any of you? Okay. Yeah, there's a few people. Now, here's something that you need to recognize. People will talk about, well, you got to get out the vote, you got to talk about things. But just for, for the students here, you need to know that, that there were 51,000 votes cast in that, in that, uh, in that Senate, state Senate election. And I lost by 282. So people who say that the votes don't count, I'm looking right at the students and everything, when you, need, you need to get out there and you need to mobilize people, because that really matters. But, based, but, but going back to my, the, the theme about what, what we need to do and what, what you need to put forward some ideas on, is one of the things that I noticed when I was up there is that we have this, we have this uh, legislature that doesn't tend to think strategically and doesn't tend to think about policies and larger issues. They tend to just think in terms of, we'll put a bill forward and we'll talk about it. What we need to do as Republicans is sit down and say, look, what are the policies that would create jobs, for example? And what is the set of bills you need to put together? What is a strategic set of policies that will get you there rather than putting together this disjointed, these disjointed plans? So those are the things we really need to be thinking about. So I would really emphasize to the students that, that uh, learn about these issues and, and think, think about them in terms of how is it that you can present these to people in a coherent, strategic way so that they realize that Republicans really do know how to govern, that we're not just the party of, against these other ideas. And yes, well, the, you can certainly talk about those, but that's not really what, what, what you really ought to be thinking about. You ought to be thinking about those positive aspects. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dennis Linthicum. I'm currently a Klamath County Commissioner, and uh, I want to stress today that the future belongs to the people and it belongs to the youth. 
look around and count the number of gray heads in this room. And they won't be here forever, right? We all know that. There's, a, there's only a future that belongs to the youth. And so um, let me talk a little bit tonight about what it means to be a true Republican. I think the uh, first Republican president wasn't actually Abraham Lincoln. It was Thomas Jefferson, followed by a Jacksonian method of Republicanism. And Republicanism looks like this quote from Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine said, let the names of Whig and Tory become extinct. Let them be heard no more. In other words, Thomas Paine was tired of the Democrats and the Republicans and the infighting and the garnering for positions of power, and he wanted something different. He says, let them be heard no more. Give me instead an open and resolute friend. That's what I'm looking for. Give me instead good citizens, people who cared about America, and give me people who will be defenders of the rights of mankind and these free and independent states. That is what the Republican Party stands for, and those are the ideals that we want to take forward. It's this idea that has become corrupted. The federal government today has gorged itself on power and is wielding that power in unwarranted ways. I'm running as a congressman in a primary against Greg Walden. Um, I am trying for the second district position, which today is the only Republican uh, congressional seat in the state of Oregon. But I think the ideas of republicanism, the ideas of these conservative values, the ideas behind liberty, the ideas behind self-governance are ideas that are worth arguing about. And so that's why I'm here tonight, is to help go through some of these ideas. I uh, am so happy. I think, actually, if anyone here has a cell phone, most people tell you make sure it's turned off. I'd like you to turn it on, call a friend, and tell them how much good food is here, and have them stuff this room and uh, stuff their tummies as well. We need to speak the voice of liberty, and we need to make sure that people understand that the current path of the federal deficit spending model will destroy our nation. And we've got to get a grip on what that means. The cake is really upside down. If you think about it like this, people have rights. You hear arguments like states' rights, but states don't have rights. People do. States have been delegated powers from the people. The people are necessary for the state, and they've simply been delegated responsibility. In turn, the states delegated responsibility to the federation of states, that federal or national government that we're familiar with. This is a model where people are the powerhouse, and they're the ones delegating certain responsibilities. Today, the federal government has assumed the rights and responsibilities that belong to you and I. That's why you can't buy an incandescent light bulb. That's why, actually, none of the youth here have been ever seen what a two-gallon flush toilet looks like. They were outlawed way back when, right? This is weird stuff. Why is the federal government involved in these issues? Because they know better? They're violating your First Amendment rights and your Fourth Amendment rights daily. They're violating your Ninth and Tenth Amendment rights. Will your Second Amendment rights survive? <coughs> I don't think so. So until we recognize what self-governance, what this great experiment looks like, and how we turn this model around, we are in trouble. Thomas Jefferson also made a note to a friend. He said, if ever the people become complacent, then you and I, he's talking to Ed Carrington, you and I, the assemblies, the Congress, and the governors shall become as wolves. In other words, even good men will become corrupted by power. And we know this is true. You guys can finish this sentence for me. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely, you guys weren't very enthusiastic with that. <laughs> this is really, really dangerous. 
why are we allowing concentrated power in Washington, D.C.? The power belongs to the state, and it belongs to the people. It belongs to your county. We need to stop it from going to the federal government, and we need to take it back. Once our liberties are lost, they're lost forever. I think Sal made an excellent point. Don't prostitute your principles. If you believe in these ideas, stand fast and fight for them because they will make or break our nation. Thank you. My name is Dennis Linthicum, and I uh, look forward to your support. What we need is a governor who will look five years, 10, 15, 20 years in the future and then take action to help accomplish the goals that we set for our state long term. I mean, does it make sense that we have a deep water port at Coos Bay and it just sits there and there's talk about doing things with it, but the coast, Oregon coast, is in depression. And why? Because they can't get access to, to get their goods in and out. The infrastructure is not there like it needs to be. Why wouldn't it make sense for us to have a governor who goes back to D.C. and works with the Federal Transportation Department to have a plan to, to create a new freeway from Coos Bay to Burns to Ontario, which would allow goods to get in and out of a deep water port, and deep water ports are hard to come by. San Pedro is, is congested. Portland's congested, Seattle, Tacoma, they're congested. What we really need to do is have this deep water port and make it into something that will be a thriving generation, uh, a generator of income. This can be done, but only if you're looking long term. That doesn't happen overnight. It would also open up Eastern Oregon. Why don't we have, the, we have tremendous amounts of property over there, real estate. You know, and you drive, if you ever drive in rural Oregon, you could be, just be seeing desert, high desert, and tumbleweed, and then all of a sudden you come across this green lush area that's a big circle, right, where they stuck a straw down into the aquifer, and they're irrigating, and then you get past this lush growing cropland, and what do you see? More desert. Do you realize Oregon uses 0.6 tenths of 1% of the Columbia River water? Six tenths of 1%. Washington State, 3%. Idaho, 5%. And Oregon gets 6 tenths of 1%. If we were to double that to 1.2%, all right, still less than half of what Washington gets, we wouldn't kill a single fish. We could even take the water just during the high water times in the winter. But we could irrigate 100,000 more acres of Oregon farmland and make it grow and, and blossom like a rose. We could generate with that vision and that time 10,000 new jobs from planting all the way to retail, transportation, and exporting because we would be sending our crops, not only would we feed our state, but we would be exporting crops to other states and to other nations. It only makes sense for us to become more self-reliant. Right now, America, at least what I read, uses about, it gets about 50% of its food from other countries. Do huh. you ever stop to think? where that food is coming from. And I've been to China 11 times. Their, their ideas of um, fertilizer and, <laughs> and so forth, a little different than what we've got. But the question is, is it meeting the standards that we want for our food? Do we really want to be so dependent on the shipping lines from Peru or from China or other places when we have the capacity to grow so much in our own state? <coughs> we should be working long-term to be more self-sufficient in food, more self-sufficient in energy and in transportation. We have the ability to do this, but only with vision. And it's not going to happen unless we as Oregonians decide that we're not going to sit this one out. That now is the time for change that will bring prosperity. As a governor, I want you to know I'm not going to be going to Bhutan, a third world country, to learn how to be happy. You know, back when our governor should have been focusing on Cover Oregon, he and Sylvia were in Bhutan learning about gross domestic happiness. Imagine GDH. Well, I want greater GDP, and I want third world countries to come to Oregon to find out how to be prosperous and free, not having Oregon go to third world countries 
to figure out how to be happy when you're in a, a malaise and in poverty. We can take our state back, but only if we decide to do it. My wife and I didn't get into this lightly. And I've been in the legislature for 11 years. I was elected Speaker Pro Tem unanimously by the Democrats and the Republicans in the House because I'm willing to be honorable and work across the line. I'm running as a, an Oregonian with experience, not as a Republican versus a Democrat, but as a Republican who happens to have experience and cares about our state. We can do this, but only if I get the help that I need. Kathy and I said, you know, this is a nine and a half year mission. I mean, this is a year and a half to get elected, and then the voters willing, eight years in office, to right this ship of state, to bring us back to the prosperity that we used to have. To be, we used to be known as number third in the, in the country in education. Oregon was a, a light to the other states. And now we are number 48 in graduation rates. When you realize nearly a third of our Oregon high school students don't graduate with their classmates, that's unacceptable. Our current governor said, I'll be the governor who will help uh, fix education. I'll hire Rudy Crew to come in from New York, pay him $284,000 to be a part-time guy because he was gone much of the time out doing speeches and those kinds of things, and leveraging it into another job someplace else. That did not fix our Oregon education system. We don't need the idea of having grandiose ideas, turning it to somebody else, and then heading to Bataan. What we need is, is a governor who's a CEO, who will work with the legislature, the legislative leaders, who will use technology to help get things done. Let me tell you, I'll close with this. I pres if you get the newsletter that I send out by email, would you raise your hand? How many times do you get that? Okay, you know, roughly in this instance, about a third. Sometimes it's usually you know, 20% wherever I go. This newsletter goes out to roughly 416,000 email addresses. And so uh, when I write this, I, I deal with issues. And I write about the pros and cons of issues and come up with often you know, what I think ought to be done and inform the public as to what's going on. Sometimes when we have an issue that's difficult to decide what to do, normally in the past, your leaders, your representatives, merely pass laws and you have to live with the consequences. But with 416,000 Oregonian email addresses, I send out the information and I'll ask for input from the citizens. And it may be an issue that most people don't know anything about or don't even care much about. But there's always a group of Oregonians who are experts on whatever that issue is. And so when I get their input back, it's truly government by the people. Because I'm saying, here's the situation. You've elected me to be a representative, but I need input to know what to do. Because I don't have, you know, I mean, I've been a base a decision on a 30 second sound bite. I want to be researched. I want to represent you well. So I get this input from knowledgeable Oregonians. And then what happens? We take that input and it gives the basis for a rational decision on whatever that issue is. We can do this even better with me as governor. Because as governor, I will continue to write this newsletter. I'll have a little help with research, which would be nice, because you have a staff. But we can take an issue, and you can name the issue. And if it, I believe firmly that every issue that is being, that is being affected uh, or concerned about by Oregon is being successfully solved somewhere. Okay? I mean, stop and think about it. Every problem, every challenge, every issue that Oregon is facing is being successfully resolved somewhere. So why wouldn't we learn from the beta of other states and other countries? Learn from their mistakes and their successes. And so we take an issue, and as your governor, I will write about that issue. I will have you give you the, the pros and cons, the alternatives as to what's being done elsewhere, and then a recommendation. And this recommendation, you'll either like or dislike. If there's problems with it, you'll let me know and we can adjust. But if you like it, then you will contact your legislators, senators, representatives in the state legislature, and let them know that you want them to support the governor's plan on education or on health care or whatever the issue might be. Right now, it's very, very difficult to get any change. Reforms always talked about, but never implemented. If you get close to re really getting, we're going to implement something and there's going to be reform, then it's time for a blue ribbon commission. And if that comes back in two years later, 
You know, it's like, oh no, we need a commission. We, we need a task force now. Because we want to really study this out. And it's because there's this coalition of the status quo. It's always about maintaining things the same as they are because the lobbyists, the special interests, those that are financially affected by change don't want change. They like knowing what the rules are and staying basically the same. So, you, so we go, we say, all right, we're going to defund this program because it's not needed anymore. Well, that program then, it has constituents, right? And so what do they do? They, the leaders who make their salaries from the program, they contact all the members and they say, you got to contact your legislators and tell them that they can't defund us because we're doing good. And so we need the funding. And so you'll get 20 or 30 people contacting a legislator and that's like an outpouring, right? And so the legislator then goes to the co-chair of Ways and Means, knocks on the door and says, Dennis, you, you've got to fund this. Or Peter Buckley, you've got to fund this because it's so important. I'm getting pressure from my constituents. And so that's why it's so hard to make any changes in government. You remember Ronald Reagan? The closest thing that you'll ever see toward an, uh, an eternal, uh, eternal life is a government organization or a government program. I mean, because they're so hard to to shut down. But with what I'm describing to you, supposing I had 800,000 emails and we sent out to all of the citizens this solution that's proposed and well considered, and it, you know it's a rational approach, and then you as citizens decide to contact your legislators, Democrat, Republican, Independent, doesn't matter, and they hear from hundreds of citizens or thousands of citizens who say, support the governor, we're tired of just talk, we want change, we want implemented change, we're willing to support the governor and bring about reform in this area. All of a sudden, you see how that shifts the power structure? Because legislators, and I've been one for 11 years, you respond to pressure from the people. But in the past, the people don't find out about what's gone on until after it's done. The laws passed. And then there's, oh, oh, we didn't think about that. We didn't know it was going to hurt you. We wanted to help. You know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? The legislative body has great intentions. But it's not about intentions. It's about results. So we have a plan on how to govern better. We have a plan for vision for our state. We have a plan on how to implement a program to lessen the cost of government programs that are non-priorities so that we will have more assets to focus on the high priorities. And we can do this without raising taxes. We can do this by asking a question. We go to every program, every agency, every board, every department, and we start with this question. If this program did not exist today, would we create it? Simple question. If it didn't exist today, would we create it? And if the answer is no, why are we funding it? I mean, doesn't, doesn't that make sense? If it's a low priority and you wouldn't start it, then why do you keep throwing money at it? So at that point, you say, all right, are there any components of this program or agency or commission or department that you do need to have? And you take those and you place those in a, in a, a program or agency that's going to continue, and then you shut down the low priority take the resources that would have been spent on it and apply it to your high priorities. That way you have, you have management by objective, not management by status quo. It's going to take time, it's going to take effort, it's going to take money. And today when I was meeting with the owners of, of telecommunication businesses, I want you to know I was focusing on money because they've been blessed with success. They're creating jobs and they're benefiting from the work that they're doing. I am grateful for any amount of contribution. I'm grateful for any amount of time. A volunteer is someone who will spend three hours a week or more. I mean, that's how we define it. And if you're more than, if it's less than that, hey, we're grateful for anything, right? But if, if you have three hours a week and you say, you know what, I will contribute three hours a week between now and November to help change the future of our state, to change the government, to put it back on a path based on principles that are meaningful, that have been shown to be correct. If you'll do that, then come and join the throng. Join this movement. It's not a campaign. It's a movement 
toward greater freedom, greater opportunity, and greater prosperity. Help. Be a part of that. If you have $5, take an envelope and send it. Send it in. Because that means that you have financially contributed. Okay, absolutely. What, what is our, what would our administration be like as far as green, green energy? Oregon needs to be energy independent and not just dependent on other places. And that means that we focus on those things that, that are the, the wave of the future. And I think wind and, and uh, solar are great. Wave is thrown in there, but wave is so far behind the curve, it's hugely expensive, and they can't seem to make it work off the coast of Oregon yet. But you know what's sad is that hydroelectricity is a constant 24-7 form of, of generation of power, but the current administration views it as if it is not a renewable resource. And so when they say we want to increase the dependency on less on uh, carbon-based and more on alternative, they exclude any hydroelectric electrical power that has been brought into line or online since 1996, I believe the time is. And so yes, we need to do it, but not make it a political issue, but based on what is the results you want and what are the options, what can we do to promote development. I want innovators, entrepreneurs, I want people with vision to come to Oregon. I want to pass laws that make this a place that's attractive for entrepreneurs and innovators and not one that repels them. That question. Yes, sir. You know, uh, that 0.6% of, of the Columbia River water that this party uses seems awfully, awfully small. What, what would it take legislatively or whatever? To, what's keeping us from using more? Okay. The, the question is what is causing us to use so little of the Columbia River? And primarily, uh, in the past, it was because we, we didn't really need it. I mean, it just wasn't viewed as important. In the last decade or two, it's been prevented by radical extremist uh, environmentalists who do not want to put the nose of the camel under the tent. In other words, they say, even if we give you a little bit more water, you'll just want more, and we don't want to do that. And that, it makes no sense. We wouldn't kill a single fish. I think we ought to be studying the aquifers. I mean, maybe it would make sense, why don't we find out, to take water out of the Columbia and pump it into the aquifer and then put a straw 100 miles east of there, meaning a well, and pull it out. I mean, you don't have to necessarily build, um, you know, build uh, aqueducts. There's, there's things that we ought to be considering that we're not considering. And why? Because in government, what you hear is no because. When you have ideas, Here's what they say. Well, no, we can't do that because uh, it doesn't make sense or, or we don't like it or there's not enough people. I brought up about the, the freeway, putting a highway from Coos Bay to Ontario and talked to the leaders of Oregon. They said, no, we can't do that. I said, why is that? I said, because there's not enough demand for it. I said, if you were around when they were considering I-5 and I-84, we wouldn't have those freeways either. Not enough demand for it. And sometimes you have to have the vision and you have to have a governor who will work with the federal government, private enterprise, contractors, landowners, and the state to get things done. But we need yes if, not no because. By the way, I would suggest you consider that in your own lives. Too many people run their lives based on no because. I can't do that because I don't have the money. I can't have more children because we can't afford it. I can't, you know, there's always reasons. But maybe it makes sense, and this is what I live by, that you say yes if. Yes, we could have another child if we were to cut back on spending money for a latte every day. I mean, yes, if. If you have the attitude that you could do something and then you list what the barriers might be that keep you from doing it, then you can say, are these barriers surmountable or insurmountable? But it changes the whole dialogue because you're saying, we can do this if we do these things. Maybe let's, let's go forward instead of no because nobody else has done it and we don't want to rock the boat. Yes, sir. Greg Reeser, um, I have a question. It seems that the public employees unions have an inappropriate amount of influence over all politics in Oregon. How do we address that situation? 
Okay. Uh, it's, it, what you have said is the absolute truth. The most powerful groups in the capital are the government unions because they're watching out for their own. I mean, what do unions do? They represent union members. What a shock, right? I mean, that's what they do. It's like the guy who was asked, when are you going to really start caring for the kids? He was involved with the teachers' union. When are you going to really start focusing on the kids like you always say you're going to do? And the answer was, when they got a union card, of course. <laughs> it's like, oh, duh. You know, I mean, it's all propaganda. It's marketing so that you achieve your goal. And your goal is to promote and protect those that you are paid six digits every year to promote and protect. What needs to happen is we for <coughs> PERS. PERS is a huge issue. PERS is the Public Employee Retirement System. It is continuing to go up and will go up again in the next two years. And this is the amount of a percentage of payroll that goes to retirement benefits. And we have some of the most lucrative retirement benefits for people that were hired before 1996 of any public plan in the country. Okay, it's called PERS Tier 1. Well, that costs a lot of money, a huge amount. I could go into details as to why, but the key is how do you get your arms around this problem? And what you do is you first analyze and, and understand that not everything that people get right now is contractual. The government gives and the government can take away, but the unions, of course, they're saying, oh, no, it's a contract, you've got to honor your contract. Well, I understand that, and we ought to honor our contracts. But saying that everything that the state gives is a contract, you know, does that apply with your taxes? Can you imagine in a business, and you've got a tax rate, and now the legislature decides to raise your taxes, that you go and say, no, no, you can't raise taxes because we've got a contract. I've been planning my life on these tax rates as they are. You can't make them higher. And the answer is, well, yes, we can, because we represent the people, and if you have a large enough vote, you can raise taxes. So what we need to do is look at each of the areas of the PERS system and, and then pass a bill that sends to the Supreme Court these areas that are questionable. For instance, is it, do you know what spiking is? You know, your retirement is based on your highest average wages for three years, your highest three years. And so just before you retire, it's a common practice to go to your buddies and say, hey, I need a lot of overtime. I don't want to take vacation time. I don't want sick leave. I don't, you know, whatever the, the issue is that will allow you to increase your income for the purpose of determining your annuity. And I read a statistic, statistic nationally that said that it was nearly 40% in some of these retirement plans, an increase in the value of the annuity by 40% because of spiking. So is spiking contractual? Or is it something that the legislature is allowed to happen because they're in bed with the government union? Why don't we find out? And so you go to the Supreme Court, you give them multiple options, they will determine what is contractual and what isn't, and then you adjust based on what, maintaining the contract, but not everything else. So that's what we need to do with PERS. You had a question way back. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the budget deficit. And I, I think any reasonable person would agree that's a long-run problem. So to deal with that, you have to cut spending and or raise taxes. If you would cut spending, you personally would cut What are your preferred programs to cut by how much? And if you prefer the raising taxes route, how far would you raise taxes and on whom? OK. Excellent questions. Uh, we're 45 or 50 days before the primary. I will answer them in a way that uh, I think is appropriate, and I'll tell you how we will make that determination. If I were governor right now, I could tell you where we need to do that, and I, if the governor were here, that would be a great question for him because this is his third term. What I would do as soon as I get elected is I will put together a team of very, very knowledgeable men and women from the private sector, and we will go, the, the first question that we're going to ask, that, that I'll ask of them, is to define what we want from state government. What is the purpose of state government? Right now, it's just keep funding and keep expanding. But if you don't know what it is, you're, what outcomes you want, then how do you know if you're funding the right things? And so we define that, then we define where we want to be in five years, 10, 15, and 20. Then we look at what is happening in other states to determine what is succeeding that would accomplish our goals if we were here. And then we make those determinations. 
you have to prioritize your spending. And then you have to know how much money you need for your highest priorities. And then when you run out of that money, you stop spending. But it would be inappropriate for me to start laying out where I think those cuts ought to be made, because that needs to be part of the process in determining where we really want our state to be. Yes, sir. What are your thoughts on term limits? Back in those good old days, we used to have a citizen legislature where people would go to Washington or the state capitol and they'd work and then they'd go home and be productive members of society the rest of the year. Um, now we have just generation after generation of professional politicians like our current governor who are basically there in perpetuity until they get kicked out of office or until they decide to retire because of the power of incumbency. Um, if you were elected, would you commit to only serving two terms, or what are your thoughts on term limits? I want, to, I want you to know I would make the commitment right now I would not serve more than two terms. Of course, I'd be 70 some years old at the end of the second term, but that's all right. You know, sometimes people that are old want to serve. <laughs> this is not Congress in DC where you end up. I mean, I think that there may be, there, nobody had admitted, but there may be senators who have been dead for years, you know, but they kind of stuck them and they go up and they just put their own <laughs> Because it's all about seniority, you know? What was that movie where they you know, had the guy that uh, had these Bernie. two guys? Bernie. Bernie, that's right. You know? We have politicians that are like that because the longer you're in, the more power you have. We have a constitutional provision in the Oregon Constitution that says that a governor should not, will not serve more than two consecutive terms. Okay? The idea was two terms and you're out. We have a governor who went out, had a surrogate come in. I mean, there was, let's see, Governor K, Governor K, tough name, yeah. So we had Kulingowski for eight years, and now we're back to Kitzhopper again. But you can't see the difference in their policies because they both are beholding to the, the unions, both beholding to those that want to maintain control of the status quo. I think term limits, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a dangerous, um, provision because if in favor of term limits is that you take the guys out and now who's got the experience? Who's got the mental knowledge, the, the institutional memory? It's the lobbyists and the, the bureaucrats, the people whose careers are there. And so on one side you say, well I don't want a guy to be in the legislature for two years to figure out where the bathroom is, for two years how he's going to be in leadership, for two years he's in leadership and then he's gone when how do you understand the state budget? It's sixty billion dollars, and you don't just come in and figure these things out. And so I think the people are going to have to decide that. And I could—I'm a lawyer. I, I can argue it either way, and I'd be happy to support uh, whatever the people decide on that. They voted in term limits at one point. They were found by the Supreme Court to be unconstitutional. It could be changed with a constitutional amendment, uh, but I don't see people. It, it doesn't seem to be a hot issue right now. Yes, sir. Yeah. How do you explain your vote for Cover Oregon uh, versus the party platform for free market and fiscal conservative? Great. The question is Cover Oregon. How do we vote? How, you know, why did I vote in favor? I was co-chair of Ways and Means. Yeah. And so we had the decision to make. It's February of 2011. The federal government says we have Obamacare. It is going to be what is implemented across the state, and we're going to have Medicaid tied to it. And we have hundreds of thousands of Oregonians that are in Medicaid. Okay, Medicaid is the Oregon Health Plan. And so I was co-chair of Ways and Means, and they said, okay, we've got $48 million of federal money. It's free money. It's federal money. And I said, no, no, no. It's not free money. It's taxpayer money. And the mere fact that it, it may not directly be coming from our state coffers doesn't mean that we shouldn't treat it like a stewardship. And so I believe that, and I really do believe that, your representatives need to be stewards over the money and treat it as if it were their own. And so I said no. And so two weeks later, they came back and, and they were coming back repeatedly saying, we have this opportunity to craft a website and a way to process applications that will be better than anything else in the country. And the federal government wants to use Oregon as an early adopter there's five states that they put money into with the ideas that they would make it work, and then the other states could utilize that. And so they said, so we can either sit this out or we can be the ones to actually have a, a system that will work for people to go to, sign up, and get the benefits. 
And so I said, I'm not willing to do this. I don't want to waste the money. Look what happened with MMIS, which was an IT project that way over budget and still it doesn't work like it's supposed to. Department of Motor Vehicles, the Department of Revenue, it's been one project after another that was failed. So finally, they came and said, we believe that we can do this better than anyone else. And so what would it take for you to agree to allow us to be an early adopter? And so I communicated with, uh, with analysts that are very experienced in large projects, and they said, you know, it would work, or it could work, if they would follow the same management requirements that a $100 million IT project in the private sector would use. And so I said, okay, what is that? And they said there's one of them is PMBOK, and I don't remember what the initials stand for, but it's a, an engineering protocol for large projects. And so they, this was presented, they agreed that they would hire on the, uh, uh, the quality control, QAs, quality assurance teams, that they would have quality control, that there would be uh, deadlines and, and cutoff dates, if they don't have something by this date, then it shuts down. All of these, these uh, provisions that you would have if it was your money. So I agreed to it at that point and voted for it with the idea that they would make this work and with the promises that they gave us. The challenge was that we got the quality assurance teams, we did all of that, but I could not anticipate that they were going to ignore it. And so in September of 2012, I wrote letters to all of the leaders with a quality assurance report that said this project is in jeopardy. They have inadequate foundational documents, inadequate leadership, inadequate experience, they're not handling it the right way, and so I presented that to the leaders of Cover Oregon with a copy to the governor. This is September of 2012. It was ignored. A week later or so, I sent another letter, this was also detailed to the governor himself, explaining why he had to take action or the quality assurance team is indicating this is going to fail. He ignored it. So I called him, he returned my call, it was really interesting because when he returned my call, Dave Dodderer happened to be in the room. And so he overheard this conversation. And in it, I explained to the governor why it was going to fail, what the QA was saying, and all of these things. And I'm going into this detail because I want you to understand that this I did vote for it, but it was based on the assumption it was going to work because we put in all these safeguards. Cover Oregon is the issue it is today because these safeguards were in place. If they hadn't been in place, this would be another failed program nobody would know about, it would be swept under the carpet, and it would have been forgotten. But because they broke the promises and failed to perform in the way they should, it has failed. Other states did it right, we didn't do it right. Because of that failure, we've seen that we have a governor who refused to take the warning 13 months later. The very thing that I warned them would happen is what happened. And so, you know, you represent the people the best you can, if I had it to do over again, I would not have approved it because I would know that it's going to fail. But based on the sideboards that we put in place, it looked like we could make this work and it would be an example for the rest of the state. Thank you. I don't, I, I, can I ask just one more question? Oh, please. Uh, just one more question, then we'll, we'll shut it down. Yes, sir. I have, um, I have two questions. <clears throat> the first one is how do, how do you feel about uh, the Oregon vote to secede? from the United States. And the second one is, how do you feel about uh, medical marijuana becoming legal in Oregon? Okay, two part question. First question is, how do we feel about uh, Oregon seceding from the United States? Well, it was tried <laughs> maybe 150 years ago or so, it was tried, it didn't work real, way, real well. I think that we have a constitution that has been ignored by our governors They've allowed too much pressure to go to the federal government that when you look at a flag, you don't see a star and a sickle, you see 50 stars. This government was established, the federal government was established by the states, and that you need a governor who will understand the Ninth and Tenth Amendments are still in play, who will speak out for the people, and will make our system work. To try and secede is merely a, a, it's a fool's errand because you're not, it's not going to happen. You have to get agreement if like we were going to cut our, our state into the state of Jefferson. California and Oregon would need to agree with that. Congress would have to approve it. It's just not going to happen. If other people want to pursue that, that's fine. My focus is on becoming the governor and working within the Constitution that we have to make things work. 
The second part was on medical or was on legalization of marijuana. The medical marijuana program that Oregon has is a dismal failure. Anybody can have recreational medic, uh, marijuana by paying the fee, saying that I had a history of pain. I mean, the history maybe you you know you pulled your shoulder when you were 18, you know, but it's a, it's all it says you have history of pain, and now you get your card. So how are you going to fill that card? Well, you're going to grow your own. You're going to get somebody else to do it. You go on the street. It is not working. So does that mean we should just legalize marijuana? Well, wouldn't it make more sense to not go that route right now? We have Washington State, we have Colorado, they're going that route. I say, citizens, stand by for a year. Let's see what happens in Colorado and Washington. I talked to a law enforcement officer in Washington. He said they're driving under the influence of intoxicant pullovers or, or, or instances have gone up 120% since they've legalized marijuana. But they can't do a a blow test, you know, on the scene. They have to take somebody to the hospital, do all of that, you know, that you get a blood test, get a, a warrant, and it takes police officers off the road. So my feeling is that we would be wise to address this as the citizenry, and the voters will decide this, but it shouldn't be decided this year. We should wait and take the best of what we learn from Washington and Oregon and Colorado, and then formulate a, a ballot measure for the citizens of the state of Oregon based on good science, good process, good procedures, and, and not make the same mistakes that are being made elsewhere. Thank you so much. Dennis Richardson, Dennis Richardson, that's fun.